I get asked this a lot, and actually, I gotta be honest, even my mother to this day is like, how did you end up in oral care? Because all of you lot, you trained in it. You did it, you went to university, you studied it, you know a huge amount of it. And I'm sitting there being like, I'm English. Uh, I didn't go to university to study it. I actually went to study geography. And it's like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'll give you a quick backstory how I started Burst or how I ended up in oral care, which then led to Burst. So I was 19, I was at university. I was studying geography, as I said, a bit of an odd one. Um, at the time, I kind of wanted to go into the city. I, uh, I thought, let's, let's be a banker. Um, and then I realized that actually, you can't be a banker and have absolutely repulsive hair because people look at you and they're like, well, I'm not giving that guy my money. So there was none of that. So I sat there and I was like in my second year and I was thinking, what on earth am I gonna do with myself if I'm not gonna go into the city? I need to have some form of job when I leave, otherwise my parents are gonna throw an absolute hissy fit and think that you know, I failed. So I, I sat around, I had a couple of drinks as you do at university. Um, at, you can drink at 18 in the UK. Uh, it's unfortunate for the livers. But anyway, I, I had this, this, this drink uh, and another drink. And then I thought, you know what? I was sitting there looking at my toothbrush and thinking, well, it wouldn't be nice if it, if it stood up. Like, you know, it probably stood up. And it didn't fall over because it was always this problem of, you know, it goes over and it looks a bit grubby when you're at university. It's particularly grubby, there are five blokes sharing one of those cup holders, a bit rank. Anyway, so I ended up coming up with this idea, which later became the Rockabilly Kids. The Rockabilly Kids, as you can see, this was my idea. And drunk as I was, I thought this was fabulous, actually. Like, you could come up with a product that self-stood. Um, and you could put fun designs on it. This was, it was a princess. Uh, I was very pleased with this princess. She was, she was great. I sold very well. Anyway, I did that, and at the time, honestly, my parents thought, you are insane. They're like, you're not going into the city, and you want to do toothbrushes, and you don't just want to do toothbrushes, you want to do toothbrushes for children, which is a bit niche when you're 19. You know, you're going to, you're going to drinks, and everyone has these drinks parties, and everyone's sitting around, what are you going to be? Uh, and the, the cool guy to my left, he'll say, you know, I want to go into the city, I want to make loads of money, and I'm going to retire young and play golf. And I was thinking, well, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Um, so I was like, well, you know, and the girl then turns to me, what do you do? And I said, I, I, you know, I want to sell toothbrushes for children. Now, if you want to dead end a conversation, you, you say that. And I kind of learned the, the good way, like if, you, if I ended up in a conversation, even years later, and someone talks to you at a bar or, you know, at a restaurant or at a cafe, you know, what do you do? And they're trying to make conversation. I sell toothbrushes for children uh, and I make them myself. Weird, a bit odd. Shuts the conversation. Anyway, I did this and I thought, great, what are we gonna do now I have this, this product? I, I had it and it was all ready to go. So I thought, okay, I can't sell it online. It's a little bit inexpensive. It's a manual toothbrush. It's a fast moving consumer good. So where am I gonna go? So I went to the retailers of the UK. I probably, you know, the big one in the UK is Boots, which is like our equivalent of a CVS or a Walgreens. It dominates the market though. So whereas Walgreens and CVS kind of compete, Boots is more like, it's a, it's a solo number. Like it's huge. Actually, it's now got bought by Walgreens, um, interestingly. But anyhow, I rung and I rung and I rung and I rung and eventually, and I emailed uh, a lot and I texted if I could find your number and I eventually got myself a meeting and I went to this meeting and they decided to stop my item. And I remember at the end of the meeting, I sat there and I was like, yeah, can I just quickly ask why, why did you take the meeting? And they were like, well, this industry is kind of like old school in oral care. Like, it's the same people over and over again and you were this kind of weird looking chap with a penchant for kids' toothbrushes, and we thought it would be fun. But clearly, they liked the product, they stocked it. I then went into the other ones, like Superdrug, I went into our supermarkets, and I was selling kids' toothbrushes. And I gotta be honest with you guys, like, as much as I'm a fanatical oral care guy now, I kept saying to myself, like, I'm gonna be out of this industry in a little bit of time. Like, I don't know enough. Like, I'm not trained in it. And I'm in all these retail shops, and I'm still sitting there being like, what on earth do I know about oral care? Like, I had this one guy, he was this great man, uh, he was my dentist when I was around three, and I used to ask his opinion on, you know, what should the bristles look like? What, how should it function? What, what angle should the, um, the head be at? Anyway, I carried on doing this for a while, and I got more and more into it. Like, I used to go to the shows, um, it's like Birmingham show, the NEC, and I made friends with the British Dental Health Foundation. And again, as I say, like, I grew a knowledge. Anyway, there was one moment with one of the retailers that I was in, and one of the big name brands, which I'm not gonna name, uh, well, I, I won the top shelf. So in retail, the best shelf's always at the top because people's eyeline sees it. And so I was really thrilled. I remember I left actually, and my mum met me afterwards. We were in London, 
uh, and we celebrated and uh, you know we went out for lunch and she was like congratulations and this woman the buyer had said you know you've got the top shelf we can't wait we had this display that was going to wobble the toothbrush and it was it was all very exciting and then a week later i get a call from the same woman who was the buyer and she was like i'm sorry to tell you but they uh like kind of confidentially but the the company rung up and they were like no nah, that that new company isn't taking the top shelf we've been here for years and you buy all our other products so uh, we're kind of, we're taking that again so i ended up no joke bottom shelf which really unamused me and at the time i was sitting there being like fast moving consumer goods you've got your retailer taking all this percentage so the price of the product was higher than i actually wanted it for a consumer but it still had to be that way for me to like make anything um because everyone was taking their, their cut, the distributor, the, the company, the, you, know, you import it and all those duties, etc. So it was a little bit frustrating. At that point, I'd seen the market well enough and I really understood that electric toothbrushes, like this badass, um, well, they were, <laughs> um, they, that was like, there was a lot higher margin and there were really only two players. And so I sat there and was like, you know what, I could probably make an electric toothbrush. I was very good at manufacturing uh, by that point. I'm very good. There are people that are way better than me, but I'd done it for years. So even when I set this one up, I was 19 and I flew out from a guy, like I'd met these people online uh, who manufactured and I flew out to Shenzhen, China to see if I could get it made. Extraordinary experience. I probably need to have a whole other video just on that one trip. But again, everyone in my life thought I was insane. I actually thought I was a bit insane when I turned up there and there was no one to meet me. But again, as I say, another story. So I was good at manufacturing. So I went back you know, to Asia where most I think 95% of electric toothbrushes are made in the world. And I stayed there like a month and a half. Uh, I used to travel around, I went to Hong Kong, and then I flew to Shenzhen, then Guangzhou, and then I went down to Ningbo. Uh, and I was kind of doing a bit of a tour to work out all these factories. En route, I realized, oh my gosh, like I thought the markup was big on manual toothbrushes, but the markup on electric toothbrushes was like exorbitant. Like, put it in perspective, you, you know, you're marking up things between like, you know, between four and 12,000%, depending on where you're buying it. And I sat there being like, this isn't fair on the consumer that should be using a, an electric toothbrush. Like every dental professional, my dentist at the time was like, hey, you should be using an electric toothbrush. And so I was like, you know, I can make better. Uh, we, can, we, can do this, we can do this better. So I, I knew my factories, etc., cetera, and I, I was getting towards make, getting something made. And then on a whim, again, my life's kind of that, you go with the flow. And, um, this, this girlfriend of mine, she rung me up one day and she was like, I, I gotta be honest, I, this is a weird one for you, but I, uh, I was out in LA and I met this guy. He's perfectly nice. But he's got this thing for electric toothbrushes on subscription. And I have to be honest, that is niche in the world of business. Like it's not a common thing, especially like four years ago. And so I was like, oh cool, I'll get on a flight and chat with him. Literally the next day I jumped on a flight, I came out here, uh, which is LA. And I met them. I didn't love them. Again, that's another story. Um, they weren't my cup of tea, a little bit arrogant, a bit aggressive, and uh, I, don't know, I, I didn't think that was what I wanted to achieve. And so I took a couple other meetings with the guy I was airbnb with. He knew some people, and they knew some people, and I just kept sort of wondering. Uh, the English accent, I think, helped. It made people think I'm intelligent, whereas <laughs> that's, uh, that's to be decided later in life. Um, but uh, anyway, I took these other meetings and these guys, this other guys were like, okay, come, you know, come out here. Literally within two weeks, I'd moved, um, which was an interesting experience. I had my suitcase and I had this fold-up bike. They got tiny wheels. They're like a, a virgin wagon. Like you, 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 you were that guy at school that had one of those and everyone was like, oh my gosh, he folds his bike up and he comes to class. It, anyway, I loved it. And I got it into the overhead locker and I came across. So I really didn't have a lot of and there wasn't a huge amount of planning involved, except I knew I wanted to do it and I wanted to come to America. They understood this business, you know, that world better. They look after their teeth, the English don't. And so I thought this was a perfect combination. Anyway, one thing led to the next, one thing led to the next. And, uh, you know, things happened in that period and things were difficult. And I obviously had to get my visa because <laughs> no one wants English people over here. And so I did that. And then I had this amazing meeting where I was surfing with this guy, as you can see, long hair. I surf, and that tragedy. And I was surfing with this guy out, out back over there, like, uh, I'd say it's a mile away. Um, I was surfing with this guy, uh, Ed, fantastic man. He kept me like, you know what, it would be really good for you if you had a, a partner in crime, someone that could compliment you. And that's this kind of the beginning of my relationship with the, the one and only Britney Stewart. 
because I think it took us like two weeks to agree. I think it took her longer uh, to go for a meeting. She was a little bit like, eh, this guy's weird. Um, anyway, so she eventually met and we, we had breakfast one day and breakfast became sort of brunch and then it became lunch. And it was this amazing meeting actually, whereby we both agreed that we, we had very similar business principles. Like we really understood what each other were about, how we were gonna run a business. We were gonna do it for the good and it was gonna be a long-term thing. Like it wasn't about quit, win, make money, you know, hurt people. It was about like, let's grow to succeed together and do it in the right way with a good quality product with the right people. Um, anyway, at this point, I, I'd been sitting there talking to a lot of dental hygienists, getting their advice, etc. And I suddenly was like, oh my God, this is, these are the geniuses. Every bit of knowledge that I don't have, they have. Like, I don't understand about bristles. I don't clean teeth every day. Like, I'm 28 years old now. I was 26 then. And, you know, some of the amazing team that have been with me this whole time, they, they've cleaned teeth longer than I was a erotic thought in my dad's pants. Like, they... They, you know. So if I added you all up, like I'm looking at it now, like I'm speaking to this and we're two years later, and there's 20,000 of you and some of you, you know, you average it at 10 years. You're talking thousands of years of cleaning teeth experience. Like there is no better. So I sat there and I was explaining this to Brittany. I was like, well, if we actually speak with them, they're great people. I'm sure they'd love to get involved with us. And Brittany was like, actually, that's not a bad idea. So we, we started to build this community and ask people's opinion. And honestly, the result that we have today is a brush, like the bristles, they are because you guys wanted them. The battery life, we focused on. The charging unit, um, two parts, your opinion. And for anyone that's been involved in the company, you'll realize that this is all we're doing. So before I started doing this, actually, I had samples like all over this desk of new products we're developing. We have to keep things a bit quiet because now we've got a bit bigger. People kind of, they're on the hunt. But generally speaking, that was kind of how it started. And if I looked back to... You know, after Brittany came involved, came involved, and I was like, okay, we need to go to the community. They are the secret source. That, that it will be their company. I, you know, started building this group online, and even today, I get people who like, meet me at a dental show, and they're like, "You're that guy. You're that guy that that linked in me like two and a half years ago, just saying, can I get your opinion?" And I'm like, "Oh, I am that weird guy. I got like fifteen thousand connections." On because I begged for it. I begged for it. And I'd contact all these hygienists, all these dentists. I'd be like, can I just get your opinion? All these assistants should be like, I just need to, I need to understand your knowledge. And I did do that. And that's kind of how it began. And then we ended up in this community. And now we're, I think it's 10,000 on Facebook with 22,000 now um, of you dental professionals. And it's, to be honest, it's pretty cool. Um, and when I look for the company, like how we're going to move forward, it's with you guys. Literally, Brittany and I are just there to help basically understand what you guys want and, and what you guys want to achieve because in the end, that is the company.